All right, let's take a look at some factors that can affect enzyme activity. We'll not go into a lot of detail here, just enough for standard level, and then we'll be visiting some of this stuff in higher level and more detail in some of the subsequent videos. So this is a good starting place for, actually you can kind of, you can even pause the video and then try to figure out what are some factors that might be able to affect enzyme activity, especially if you're planning and designing your own experiment. This stuff is all over uh, textbooks. It's the very first thing that you learn about when you do anything related to enzymes. And so uh, a few of the things, obviously, let's start with uh, a brief recap of what we know about enzymes. They are biological catalysts that will help to speed up reactions. They do that by lowering something called the EA, or the activation energy, which is the energy required to allow a reaction to proceed. Normally, reactions will actually happen by themselves, but in the presence of enzymes, they can actually be sped up, and enzymes are very important for tons of metabolic processes that happen in living organisms. One of the most famous ones, of course, is salivary amylase, and uh, enzyme substrate specificity, sp specificity, sorry, enzyme substrate specificity means that enzymes catalyze a specific reaction. And that has to do with the active site, the active site of the enzyme. It's kind of like a lock and key model here where the enzyme is only supposed to bind to one specific substrate. Although later we'll see that that might not be the case. I mean, some things, most things that are poisons actually interfere with enzymes by binding to places where they shouldn't bind but they actually just happen to have a very similar shape to the substrate the enzyme is supposed to bind to. So for salivary amylase, the substrate is called starch, and it binds to the active site of the enzyme salivary amylase, and that gets broken down into maltose. So what if you vary the substrate concentration? So say you have a set amount, remember in any kind of experimental design, you are trying to keep all factors the same except for the one thing you're trying to study. That would be your independent variable. So assuming your enzyme concentration stays constant, so you have a beaker, you have some uh, a particular concentration of enzymes in there, there's a, a set amount of, con of enzymes in there. What if you start increasing the amount of substrate that's in there? So if we're talking about salivary amylase, as I increase the concentration of the substrate, of, of the starch, for example, I might expect that the rate of the reaction is going to go up, and it will eventually until it reaches a point. Well, why would it start to slow down? Because if you think about how an enzyme works, an enzyme works by binding to its substrate. So at some point, every single one of those free active sites might be filled up, and after that point, any extra starch at any given time will have no parking space, no place to actually bind to, so eventually you reach a limit. Um, and that's because you have a constant uh, concentration of enzyme that's actually there. So really briefly, here's the explanation. You can read this um, on your own. So it's a relatively proportional increase that's going to happen here. And then at high concentrations, all the active sites are fully occupied. So raising the substrate concentration is not going to have a very significant effect. Okay, moving on, what if you vary the temperature? This one's more interesting. A temperature graph of enzyme activity typically shows, tends to show, I've lost function of my mouse here. Uh, anyways, okay. Typically shows that as the temperature increases, as the temperature increases, oh, here we go. As the temperature increases, you're going to get more activity. So the temperature increasing, that means there's more energy for these particles, these enzymes, and the substrate to actually bump into each other. So they're moving around more violently and they bump into each other more. And the more they bump into each other, the more of these uh, enzyme substrate actual uh, combinations are actually happening. And it's going to increase and increase and increase up until we reach a particular point. In this case, now the energy is so high that it's not just increasing the rate of the freak of the collisions, but it's actually starting to mess with the bonds inside the enzyme. So the enzyme is actually a protein. And a protein is just a chain of amino acids that are folded to create a specific three-dimensional shape. And when there's too much energy, in other words, if it starts to get too hot, you start to break some of those temporary bonds in that three-dimensional structure, and that starts to change the shape of the enzyme, and hence change the shape of the active site. And if you change the shape of the active site, now we say the enzyme is denatured, and 
it can no longer bind to what it's supposed to bind to. So you see a pretty sharp drop off in uh, the reaction rate. So we say that the enzyme is denatured. Heat vibrations break the bonds inside the actual uh, enzyme shape. It's all about shape. Okay, so think about that. The active site actually changes shape. One important thing to note is that um, with temperature reaction rates, reaction curves, um, the enzyme activity doubles with every 10 degrees increase, 10 degrees Celsius increase. Okay. And one more thing that can actually affect enzymes is the effect of pH. And I'll try to explain this in some detail here, but most um, enzymes function at a very particular pH. So salivary amylase in our mouth, for example, my mouth relatively neutral. I haven't been drinking acid recently, okay? But uh, pH in our mouth is 7, pH in the stomach is like between 1 and 2, pH of the small intestines is between uh, 6 and 8, it could be slightly alkaline. And it turns out that enzymes work best at the pH that they're intended for. Now, the explanation of this is that pH is a measure pH is a measure of the concentration of hydrogen ions, and hydrogen ions are positively charged. And it turns out that the shape of an enzyme is held together by various negative and positive charges and some disulfide bridges and things like that. So if you mess with the number of positive charges that are in the solution where this enzyme is found, you can actually start pulling on or pushing on the enzyme and creating these uh, forces of repulsion or attraction that could actually mess with the shape, pull apart the shape of the enzyme. If you mess with the shape of the enzyme, remember it's all about shape, then you change the shape of the active site. The active site is like a lock and key mechanism, so if you change the shape of that lock, then the key may no longer fit. And so that is why we say that uh, outside of its optimum pH, enzymes can become denatured, denatured, and so they tend not to do as well uh, with the reaction they're supposed to be, so you expect a lower rate of reaction outside of the optimum pH. So that's it, a quick look at three factors that can affect enzyme reactions. You can vary any one of these. Each of these could be your independent variable in an, in an experiment, and you just have to choose what enzyme you want to use and try to figure out a way to measure the enzyme activity. All right.